let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the great service we had this morning and so fun and a relaxing um, afternoon. Let's pray that you be with me as I teach him. I go over how to answer a skeptic and a scoffer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we went over last week how to share your faith with uh, with the unbeliever. And this year, we got to go, this year, this week, there I go again, last week or this week. This week, we got to go over a little bit of apologetics, how to answer a skeptic and a scoffer. And it looks like Patrick is on uh, online. It's a good deal. So let's go ahead and go over how to answer a sco uh, scoffer and a and an unbeliever and a skeptic, because obviously, as I said last week, what you want to understand is that when you when you evangelize, you never want to go into apologetics mode right off the bat. Because if you if you go into apologetics mode right off the bat, you might actually give them ammo. Like let's say if you're uh, sharing the gospel and right off the bat you feel like that you have to defend the existence of God. Well, if you defended the existence of God and they never thought about any of the uh, arguments against the existence of God, you're just putting those arguments into their head. Don't put arguments into their head that weren't already there. You always use your apologetics and you always defend the faith when they give you a reason to. You defend after they reject, not before. Because one of the temptations in evangelism is to try to defend the Bible before they reject the Bible. Hey, that's that's not always that, that, that's not the right case, you know. When you when you share your faith, yes, you you lay down the foundation that is the biblical God, that's the true God that we rebelled against, and all the other gods are you know a result of us suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and creating uh, idols and all that stuff, you know, the Romans 1, 18 through 32. And once they reject that stuff, then you could go in and and uh, reemphasize things. But how to deal with scoffers, rejection, and unbelief. Now, if you look, Matthew 20, verse 16 says that few people are going to be saved. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pull that up on the screen for us. Matthew 16, 20. Let me get everything ready here. I'll get my Bible software up. Uh, it's Matthew 16, 20. It says, oh, 2016, my dyslexia kicks in. All right. Uh, 2016, it says, for the, uh, that's actually the wrong verse there. That was one of my typos. I, I'm looking for the verse, guys that says, uh, for many are called, but few are chosen. And we've said before that for many are called and few are chosen. What does he mean for many are called, but few are chosen? I'm going to go ahead and look up that uh, verse real quick because it's a typo and I want to be able to mark that. For many are called and few are chosen. Let's see here real quick. Oh, no, it was the right one. Uh, 2016. I just didn't read it far enough. It says, yeah, so the last will be first and the first will be last for many are called but few are chosen. So what does uh, God mean or Jesus mean by for many are called but few are chosen? First of all, we have to understand that when people are led to the Lord, you know, they're in sin. And sin means that they're spiritually dead. Which means that they have lost their connection with God. There's no relationship. And being born again from John 3.3 3 is how that relationship is restored. Your, your dead spirit is, uh, is brought back to life. Well, when Jesus says that for many are called but few are chosen, that calling is the call to salvation. And, and how do we how does Jesus or the Holy Spirit call someone to salvation? They call it through the gospel. So whenever we say that for many are called but few are chosen, that means that many people hear the gospel, but few accept the gospel because we are chosen based on our 
uh, based on our uh, response to the gospel. If they respond yes, they're elected or chosen to be saved. If they say no, they're not elected. See, there's a there's these uh, theologians out there called hyper Calvinists that will try to say that God chooses you to salvation before you even hear the gospel. No, that's not the case. That's not what the Bible says at all. That election happens, the choosing happens after you hear the gospel and respond to it. So what Jesus is saying here is that uh, for many are called, used to the gospel, but few are chosen. In other words, few will accept the gospel. And that goes back to what I was uh, teaching uh, and preaching about two months ago about the narrow and the wide gate. You know, that, uh, that narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few will find it. So we have to understand that, that when we uh, preach the word of God, when we teach the word of God, Yes, it's true that the Word of God will never return void, which means it will always have an effect on people. But that effect that it has on people is not always positive. Sometimes it's negative. Sometimes the Word of God causes people to harden their hearts. They put up their guards. They put up their uh, defenses. And because of that, that's where apologetics come in. When we preach the Word of God, sometimes the... Some, sometimes their guards go up. Sometimes they start explaining away the Bible, and we have to know how to answer their rejections. Because what happens is, is as we know, people have certain presuppositions. They have certain assumptions that they have about the Word of God, and those assumptions will blind their eyes. Those assumptions will blind their eyes to the gospel, and, and apologetics, answering the faith, helps to tear down that wall so they could recognize the Holy Spirit for what he is, uh, God trying to convict their hearts. So it's very important that we do that, that we learn how to defend the gospel. So this, is go so this process that we're going to be going through is good for defending uh, the Bible in front of not only atheists and evolutionists, but all your cults, your Mormons, your JWs, and everything else. So in this lesson, we are just going to do a general defense of his word because this is just phase one of the discipleship. We're only going to go over two things. Phase three is when we really deep, uh, dig in and, and tackle your creation and evolution and all that stuff. But phase one covers two of the biggest things that a Christian has to know. Number one, the existence of God. How can we defend the existence of God? But number two, we're going to uh, go over how do we know that the Bible is his word? Because, you know, that's a stumbling block, guys. Let's think this through. When we preach the gospel to individuals, usually their main hang-ups are either, number one, they don't believe in God, or number two, they fail to recognize this as being the creator's word. They believe in a creator, they, they believe in a God, they've corrupted that God, but they don't believe that he wrote this word. So therefore, if he didn't write this Bible, this Bible has no authority. It has no standing over your life, and it's certainly not completely true. So once we defend that, the, uh, that, that God exists, we're going to defend that he reveals himself through the word. So if we can get that foundation down, that is the foundation for all other apologetics. And that's a and that's a big, big, big thing. So let's look. It's going to be on page 150 of your curriculum notes here. Defending the existence of God. One thing that we have to realize is that in reality, God is what we call an axiom. And I'll explain what the word axiom means. It is A-X-I-O-M. And axiom means he's a self-evident truth. In other words, you, if you just examine the existence of God in and of itself, he proves himself. Period. And let's explain that for a second. All right? And I'll show you exactly how. This is the... This is the case. We're going to look at something here. Romans 1 teaches us 
that we know God exists because of the creation. That his eternal attributes are clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made. You know, uh, Romans 1, 18 through 20. Now, when we look at that, as I've said before, there's only three ways. And, and Patrick, go ahead and pay attention to this because this is going to help you in your defense. There's only three ways that the uh, world could have come into existence. Number one, it's eternal. In other words, it's always been here. And it never, the world and the universe never not existed. All right? Number two, it created itself. All right? That's a, that's a problem. And you know where I'm going with this because you've been through this. Uh, you, you all been through this many, many, many times. But number three, someone created it. Those are your only three choices. Try to think of another way the world and the universe could have come into existence. The, the universe is either eternal, it created itself out of nothing, or something outside of the creation with intelligence created it. And that, and if the third part is true, we have to remember that that being has to be eternal, and he has to be infinite, and he has to be outside of the creation. Because if he was just like the creation, then we're stuck with the first two problems yet. So he's got to be separate from it. Well, let's look at science and try to eradicate some of these. In science, you have two scientific laws. It's called the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. And these are not hard to understand. The first law of thermodynamics simply says that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed uh, by natural processes. In other words, as you look at matter and energy, no new matter and no new energy has come into existence. It is simply here. It's fixed. It, it, it cannot be uh, created, nor can it be completely destroyed. That's a scientific law. That's a scientific, uh, uh, that's a scientific fact. I mean, think about it. If you have nothing, and I love using this example. Take a mason jar, and this is just theoretical, and hook up a vacuum pump to it and suck everything out of that mason jar. Everything. All the molecules, all the bacteria, all the viruses, I mean, everything. You have a, compl a complete vacuum. Nothing at all inside of that mason jar. Nothing. No energy. No, no particles. No nothing. Theoretically, this is impossible, but just bear with me. Uh, absolute nothing. And you seal that mason jar up, put it up in the uh, closet for a million years. A million years from now, if that seal is not broken, what's going to be in that mason jar? Nothing. Because matter cannot create or destroy itself. In other words, this is against uh, this. Uh, this law is against spontaneous generation, and the idea that matter and life can generate itself out of nothing. So, that's a law that has been proven. Any scientist will agree with that. The second law of thermodynamics says that matter and energy tends. Uh, uh, does not disappear, but is just uh, breaking down into less useful forms of matter and energy. In other words, ma uh, matter and energy does not disappear. It just breaks down. Now think of this as a log. Like if you have a campfire and you throw a log onto a campfire. If you burn that log, does the log disappear? No. It just breaks down. It breaks down into what? It breaks down into other forms of matter of energy like fire, heat, chemicals, ash, light, smoke, stuff like that. It's just breaking down in the, in the, into lesser forms of matter and energy. But the log itself, the components of that law, really the atoms and the molecules that make up that law don't disappear. They just transform. That's the second law. Nothing disappears, it just transforms as it breaks down. And that process is called entropy. So let's, let's look at these two laws and really break this down here because this is important. 
If the first law is true, which science proves is true, we've never observed it to be untrue, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. In other words, uh, something just can't be created out of nothing. Well, doesn't that eliminate point number two, that the universe created itself? There's no scientific basis saying that it could just spontaneously pop into existence out of nothing. The science actually disproves that notion. So we've got a problem there. But then we've got the second law of thermodynamics, which says matter and energy is just breaking down over time through the process called entropy. That's just uh, that the molecules are just rearranging themselves. Well, if that's the case, how can the Earth and the universe be eternal, guys? Because if all energy and molecules and uh, and matter is breaking down, why do we still have any energy in the usable energy left in the universe? Why are the stars still glowing? Why are the planets still moving? Why is anything in existence? Everything should have decayed down to nothing by now. All that, uh, if, if the universe is eternal, everything should have decayed and all uh, useless matter and energy should be evenly distributed throughout the, throughout the universe because everything should have been used up. But not only that, that, that alone eliminates the fact that it's eternal because the fact that we still have matter and energy shows that it's not eternal. But not only that, let's look at a uh, philosophical uh, argument. And I use this one a lot. Let's say we go to Pioneer Park here next to the church and we see a group of kids playing hide and seek. And one kid has his eyes covered and he's counting down five, four, three, two, one. And then you hear him say, oh, thank goodness, Ready or, that took forever. Ready or not, here I come. Well, I don't know about you, but the first thing I'd ask him is, is uh, son, how long have you been counting? Oh, I've been counting down since affinity. You're going to be like, uh, no, you have it. Well, it's the same argument. See, we know that that boy hadn't been counting down to infinity because you can't trans transverse and an infinite amount of time. Well, let's let's take that argument and apply it to the universe. Let's say the creation of the universe is the same thing as him saying, ready or not, here I come. It's the same principle. You'd have to transverse an infinite amount of days to get to that day if the earth is eternal, and it's impossible. See, it's logically impossible. Why? Because what did Einstein say about time? How is time measured? By the speed of light, right? And by gravity. The speed of light and gravity, and that equals time. Where did light and gravity, where does gravity come from? Gravity comes from matter. Where does the speed of light come from? Ooh, that's a tough one. But biblically, where does it come from? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's your gravity. And in the beginning, God said, let there be light. There's your light. As soon as he created the light, time began. Period. Before then, it was eternal. There was no time. So we don't run into that problem with God because he exists in eternity. If you had an eternal universe, you have a big problem because you'd have to transverse an infinite amount of time to get to creation. So we have two reasons not to believe in eternality. So if those two choices are wrong, then that only leaves us with one rational choice, and that's to believe that God, that there is an infinite, uncreated, eternal being that's intelligent, that's outside of creation, that brought it into existence. That's how, you de that's how you defend the existence of God from science and from Scripture. Because you've got to remember that in Genesis 1-1, does the Bible try to explain where God comes from? No, they just assume, they just assume it. They said, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we have to remember that. So when people, when science tries to deny this, and they try to say that the Big Bang happened or whatever, in reality... They're trying to say that the earth is either eternal, in other words, that that little spinning ball of whatever exploded in the Big Bang and always been there, or that it created itself out of nothing, that literally nothing exploded and created everything. 
But do you see that science doesn't support it? And if they believe that, they have to leave science and go off a blind faith? They accuse us of uh, going off a blind faith? Uh, hello? Hello? They excuse us of going off a blind faith? I mean, you're saying in the beginning nothing exploded and created everything, or at the very best, at the very best, in the beginning, some mysterious matter energy exploded and created nothing. And I'm saying that in the beginning, an intelligent mind created something. See, one of them's rational here, and one of them's not, guys. And we have to really, really think that. And as we taught uh, uh, the last two uh, Wednesday nights, we're at, what this really comes down to is the Romans 1, 18 through 32 uh, suppression of truth man look at God's truth and suppress it in unrighteousness and we said in the Greek word that Greek word suppress means to hold down like uh, and it was used in the Greek to hold someone's head under water in, in order to drown them God the people take God's truth and they attempt to drown it they want to get rid of it and replace it with their own imagination that's what they're doing here because as we've seen time and time again, what did the scientists say? That they are they are willing to believe in an absurdity because the alternative is unthinkable, which is God. They don't like 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 Carl Sagan said, they don't want to allow a divine uh, foot in the door. It's a presuppositional argument, guys. So the thing is is God does exist. It's a self-evident truth. And people who deny him are simply suppressing him. Willfully suppressing him. So, no matter what, all science, theories, philosophies, and religions dealing with origins require faith. If you were in the past, if you were not there, you have to to have faith that something happened. And me and Patrick were actually discussing this the other night on the phone. The idea is how do we know that the uh, Mars rover is on Mars? You don't. Because you weren't there to see it. You're not, you're not on Mars seeing it travel around. We have evidence that they shot it up there. We have evidence from pictures and video and stuff like that that ultimately we got to take it by faith because we weren't there. So that's the idea. I mean, there's so much that's dependent on faith. And so if that's the case, if all abstract ideas like God and all past events like creation cannot be observed by science, then ultimately we have to go off of faith but if we go off of faith that means something is our object of faith trustworthy or is it untrustworthy because that's the idea we've, we've got to figure out where are we going to place our faith in are we going to place our faith in our own vain imaginations just trying to speculate about what happened in the past or or speculate about reality past beyond our observation or is there something out there that is authoritative that we can place our trust in and that brings us to a second thing that I want to think of how do we tell if something is trustworthy because being trustworthy is important is ultimately you got to define if something's trustworthy or not. And the way that we uh, know if something's trustworthy is does it adhere to what we call the laws of logic? Now, the laws of logic, don't, don't be scared of the laws of logic. The laws of logic are simply the way that all people instinctively think instinctively think in in other words these are axiomatic in order to deny that you use these laws of logic you have to use them 
You have to use them in order to deny that you have them. And you'll say, well, that doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense because I'll show you how. Here are the laws of logic. Number one, that a truth claim uh, must have evidence. Must have evidence to be confirmed to be true. Have to have evidence. Number two, a truth claim cannot have evidence proving it wrong. And we're going to break these down. And number three, a truth claim, let's put it in parentheses, must be consistent within itself. In other words, it cannot have contradictions. So let's break these down and explain exactly how this works. A true claim must have evidence. All right? What would be an example of this? Uh, well, let's start with number two. They cannot have any evidence proven it wrong. All right? Let's say that I make the claim that the Statue of Liberty is the tallest structure in New York City. Absolutely is the tallest structure in New York City. Am I right or wrong? I'm wrong. Why? Because you could go out and you could measure the other buildings there and find out that I'm violating number two because there's evidence out there proving me wrong. I mean, the New World Trade Center is taller than the Statue of Liberty. The Chrysler Building is taller than the Statue of Liberty. The Empire State Building is taller than the Statue of Liberty. Even the Trump Tower is taller than the Statue of Liberty. And there's a bunch of others in Manhattan that are. So the point is, is that's that's the example of how you can eradicate number two. There's evidence contrary. Number one's a little trickier. You know why? Because evidence doesn't prove anything. It can just confirm something to be true. And why doesn't it prove anything? The reason why it doesn't prove anything is because you don't know everything. I want you to think of this. Your life it's kind of like this bubble. This circle is like a bubble. And that bubble was your experience. This is your experience and your observation. Experience, observation, etc. It's stuff that you can experience in your life. And all that you know, all of your knowledge is within that bubble. Period. That's all you know. Okay? Number one, there could be evidence to a truth claim, and you see all kinds of evidence within that bubble. But wonder if there's evidence out here, outside of your observation, that proves it wrong. See? So it can only confirm a truth claim is correct, but it can't prove it because you don't know everything. While number two is completely objective. You could go out and test and say, well, here's evidence proving it wrong, so it's wrong. But how about number three? A truth claim must be consistent. It can't contradict itself. Well, a contradiction's got a problem with contradiction is this. If you make a contradictory statement, either one or both of your statements have to be false. I can't say that I am both in the parking lot and not in the parking lot at the same time. Right now, I'm either in the parking lot or I'm not. If I say right now, standing in this room, I'm both in the parking lot and out of the parking lot at the same time, I've got a problem. I'm contradicting myself. I'm either in the parking lot or I'm not in the parking lot. Right now, I'm standing in the church, so therefore, if I'm saying I'm in the parking lot, I'm wrong and contradicting myself. You know, and, and, and that's the point. It's got to be internally satisfied. So, if uh, an example is of this is like in science, they measure the, the lava flows coming out of Mount St. Helens, the age of that rock by radiometric dating, and it's dating, uh, and it is dating the millions and billions of years. But yet, it was just it just cooled thirty years ago. You've got a contradiction. We saw when that rock cooled, but yet still dating at an old age. 
That's a contradiction in terms. That's a problem. There's something internally inconsistent. So pretty much, any truth claim you're trying to prove has to align to that. Because if it violates any three of them, it's what we're called arbitrary. In other words, you're believing it for no good reason. Period. You're believing it for no good reason. And I like Dr. Jason Lyle's example of this. You can believe with all of your strength that the moon is made of green cheese. You could believe it and you can just hold to it, I mean dogmatically, thus saith the Lord. But just because you believe it doesn't make it true. In, in fact, the evidence proves it all wrong. So pretty much, you're believing that arbitrarily. You have no good reason to believe it. You could, you could be sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. And that's the point. You're being arbitrary. So if that's the case, let's think this through, guys. Whenever it comes to Christianity, how do we know the Christian faith is correct? Because if we use our own logic and reason alone, we have a problem because we're staying within our bubble. All we have is what we can observe and that we can experience. We need an objective source outside of that bubble that is trustworthy. Our own, because why? Are we always right? No. Sometimes we're wrong. Are we, is, is our logic and reason alone always right? No, sometimes it's wrong. Is our object and reason alone always consistent? No, sometimes we're extremely inconsistent. So that tells you something. Is our logic and reason alone by itself trustworthy? No, because we're in that bubble. There's got to be something outside of the bubble, guys. That is what is so important. So we have to have a standard by which to gauge our logic and reason. We have to have a standard by which to test it. And guess what? That standard has to match up to these. It has to. If it does not match up to the laws of logic, our standard is not trustworthy. Period. Our standard is not trustworthy. Now, here's the thing. This book right here claims, claims to be a written by the creator of the universe. Claims to be a written by the creator of the universe. In other words, this book claims to be an eyewitness document of what happened in the past. Someone who was there. So let's imagine we're going to take this book to court and lay it down on the docket and say, Your Honor, I want to challenge this eyewitness testimony to the past. It's claiming all this stuff. I want to scrutinize it. All right? I want to give it the benefit of the doubt using Aristotle's dictum, which means you give everything the benefit of the doubt, and you look at the real world and say, is there evidence confirming it to be true? Not proving it, but you can't prove anything, but confirming it to be true. Is there any evidence that outright shows it's not true, but, but also, is it internally consistent? Are there any contradictions in it? And if it holds up to that scrutiny, then you have a trustworthy eyewitness document to the facts. All right? So you're gonna you're gonna put this under the same scrutiny that you'd put uh, put any other eyewitness testimony under in court. Because that's exactly what they would do in court. They would uh, they they would essentially do it like that. Okay, so how to identify authorship of an autobiography? Okay, if God wrote this Bible, if God wrote this Bible, and it's claiming to be written by God, how would we test if the God that claims to written or write it actually wrote it? What's one of the ways that we would test it? Well. One way I can think of, and this is actually really cool, 
is when you test the autobiography, what do you look for within that autobiography to, you know, confirm that it was actually written by that person? Well, it would be stuff like uh, details about a uh, person's life. It would be, um, it would be, it would be details about a person's life, eyewitness testimony to who a person is. It would be, uh, if a person reveals something about their character, the, the, the writing should reveal that character. You know, there should be evidences of it. Well, let's break it down even further. Who wrote the autobiography entitled My Life? If you look it up on Google, you'll see it. It was written by Bill Clinton. How do we know that? Is there's a title page. Very. It says it was written by either him or a ghostwriter, but written by him. All right? How do we know the Bible is written by the Word of God? Well, it written by God because the Bible claims to be written by God. It's called the Word of God. So it's the same principle. We're going to put it through the same scrutiny. Okay? Number two. Other evidence is that, uh, you know, we've already went over the other evidence that can prove it. But let's look at that. Let's say, in my life with Bill Clinton, what are some things from his life that he could mention that we know about that would confirm that he wrote it? How about that he was married to Hillary? That he had a daughter named Chelsea? Uh, that he had an affair with Monica Lewinsky. He would never, he wouldn't come out right and said that he had an affair, but he would at least mention her name. That he was president. And then he would he would give certain uh, details that were publicly known from his presidency. And we would be able to match it up. And there's ways that we'd be able to look through news articles and stuff like that. And and certify his claims within the book. You know, we would be able to do that. We'd be able to, uh, we'd be able to affirm or to deny. Okay, well, the Bible's the same way. If God wrote it, then we need to think something through here. We have to think something through here. The Bible uh, claims that God has certain characteristics. So if he wrote this book, the book that he wrote should have the same characteristics. Number one, Titus 1 2 says that God cannot lie. So if God cannot lie, that Bible better be in there. Because it can't have any falsehood in it, in, in it whatsoever. Number two, 2 Timothy 2 13 says that God cannot contradict himself. So if God cannot contradict himself and he wrote that Bible, it better not have a single contradiction within it. But Malachi says that God cannot change. So if God cannot change, you better believe that that book better have been preserved since the beginning, that it has no changes within it. See, so that's what we have to test. Those are three characteristics of God. So, if he cannot lie, he cannot contradict himself, and he cannot change, that book better hold up to that. Because if there's any if there's any errors in it, if there's any contradictions in it, and if it has changed one bit over uh, from book to book, we have a problem. Period. You know, so we, we got to remember that. So let's put it up to scrutiny. Let's put it up to scrutiny. Does the Bible have errors in it? Now, this is a hot topic. This is a very hot topic because in this church, we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. In other words, we believe that the Bible is without error in everything that it teaches. Now, let me explain what 
inerrancy really means. That means the original autographs are without error. Now, there might have been a scribal error to crept into the copy, and if we can clear those up over time, and I'll get to that in a minute, but the originals have to be without error, okay? And we, uh, inerrancy also includes the idea that's without contradiction. Now, critics will, say, will try to point out alleged contradictions and errors within the Bible, but guys, there have been volumes written on this. And every single alleged contradiction and error in the Bible has been cleared up by the church over the past 2,000 years. There is a rational and logical explanation to every single last one of them. Because here's the thing. A true contradiction and error are ones that cannot be rationally resolved. In other words, it cannot be rationally res res uh, resolved. That means there's no answer for it at all, period. So what would be an example of a true error contradiction? A true error contradiction would be something like saying that Augustus Caesar was the first emperor of Persia. That would be a true error contradiction. See, it'd be something that's irrefutable. You don't find that in Scripture. Every difficulty that we've come across is not a true uh, error contradiction. It's what we just call a difficulty. It's something that can be explained. It's something that has a rational explanation to it. And you can find that rational explanation through study because all errors and contradictions can be cleared up really by a simple Google search. All you got to do is just Google it and someone has the answer out there for you. If the, skept if the skeptics, and sc skeptics and scoffers really wanted to see if the Bible is true, they could test it. But the point is they don't want to. They're content with the errors and contradictions that they find. They don't want to know the answers to them. They just, they just see that error and contradiction, breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, thank God, it's not authoritative. But it don't work that way. Because all these errors and contradictions are derived just by a few things. Number one, it's usually a misinterpretation. They're usually taking the Bible out of context. <coughs> Excuse me. They're usually taking the Bible out of context. They're, they're misinterpreting it. They're, they're ripping a verse out of the context of the entire Bible, out of the passage, and just putting their own meaning on it. They're doing what we call isogesis instead of exegesis, and that's the idea of reading your own interpretation into the text, while exegesis is uh, allowing the original intent to come out of the text. And the only way you can do that is to take it literal and, and to keep it in context. But they don't. They spiritualize. They, they, they rip stuff out of context. They, they misinterpret. Number two, they read, and this is closely related, they read their own biases into the text. They have a preconceived notion of what it says, and they're just reading it right in. In other, and so that's kind of this idea. If you if you approach the Bible believing there's errors in it, you're going to find errors because you're going to make errors. Uh, you're, you're going to read errors in the places that there's not errors. You're going to see something that con that seemingly contradicts, and you're going to be like, ah, really? Like like for instance, one of my favorite examples is uh, between Matthew and, uh, and Luke. One of them says there's one angel at the tomb of Jesus. The other one says there's two. It's like, ah, oh, you see, there's a there's a contradiction. One says two, one says one. It's like, whoa, 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 back up. That's not a contradiction. And here's the reason why. These are eyewitness testimonies. They're reporting what they saw. One of the dudes only saw one. The other one saw the extra one. You know? Period. The other one didn't see the other angel. This is eyewitness testimony. One person only saw one. The other one saw a second. See, you're assuming that they're lying or one of them are mistaking when 
they could be reporting what they truthfully saw. Do you see how a bias is creeping in? You automatically assume the Bible's wrong, so you're reading it into that text when there's a rational explanation for it. And that's the point, you know? So you read biases into the text. And number three, sometimes it is a mistranslation. We have, we have English translations of the Greek and Hebrew, guys. Sometimes it's just not translated right. You could go in and translate a word a different a, a, a certain way, and it will change it. Like my favorite example there is Acts two thirty eight. Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. You know. Well, it says, oh, it looks like that you gotta is he's gotta be baptized for your sins to be cleansed. No, not at all. That, because that's not teaching that you gotta be baptized to be saved. Because that word for can mean because. It can be translated as because. So it can be, it, so you could translate it, repent and be baptized because of the remission of sins. In other words, you're baptized because your sins have been taken away. Just retranslating one word could completely change the whole meaning of the text. And that's the point. So mistranslation can lead to that. But number four is a very rare scribal error. Very rare. And these scribal errors are left up to omitted words. Um, repeated words. We still do that today. How many times do you uh, write a document and you put the in twice? The, the. It happens in the Bible uh, copies too. Repeated words. Misspellings. And then the use of synonyms. Some uh, some scholar might think, oh, instead of saying, instead of calling uh, Jesus, let's say, uh, like like uh, a use of a synonym would be uh, instead of calling Jesus the kurios. Let's call him the Messias. Both of them mean Messiah. One of them's the one of them's the uh, Aramaic word. The other one's the uh, Greek word. They mean the same thing. They're sin. They're sin. That could be a scribal error. It's a synonym, and, and the Bible's full of them, but they mean the same thing because they're just trying to some some scribe is. Foolishly trying to make the word clear or easier to understand by substituting words, and it's just you don't mess with the word of God. But the point is, is all of these rare scribal errors, which are very, 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 very rare, fall into one of those four categories, and none of them, no doctrine affected. None of them have changed the meaning of the text, and none of them changed doctrine. So we have to remember that. The, the Bible has been preserved. It's it, it hasn't changed. You know the contradictions and errors are left up to those things that they don't even change the meaning of the text. So they're kind of trivial. So that's the point. It's trustworthy. It's completely trustworthy. I'm gonna pull up my favorite little uh, uh, up on the screen there. The, the favorite little chart. How do we? What do the um, Bible man uh, manuscripts look like? How have they been preserved? Well, if you look up on the chart, and I'll reduplicate it here for Patrick, it's going to be in backwards, but you got the, uh, I'll, I'll just do two lines here. You got the name of the manuscript. So let's say Plato, ancient Greek. Plato was written between 447 and 347 BC. All right? And the first copy we have of Plato was was written, was copied about 1,200 years after the original. 1,200 years, that's the earliest copy we have. That's a big time span, guys. All right? Huge, huge, huge time span. Okay? There are only seven copies in existence. Seven. Seven, and the earliest was written 1,200 years after the original. And do they agree? Now, they're full of contradictions. 
So if they're full of contradictions, I mean true contradictions, do we really know what the original said? No, we don't really know what Plato wrote. And you could go down through the writings of Julius Caesar and Homer and Aristotle and everyone else and make the same claim. But let's look at the New Testament. The New Testament was written between 50 and 100 AD. Period. And we know that by the grammar of the text, by the way. We can confirm that by the grammar, by the syntax, by historical markers. We know all these things are written per century. Even the liberal scholars believe that. Okay, there's no doubt. The first copy we have were 50 to 100 years after the original. And how do we know that? By the type of ink used, by the type of paper used, by the writing style. You know, not the grammar and the syntax, that stays the same, but the way that the letters are formed and stuff like that. We can date the documents. They're written between 50 and, uh, uh, and 100 years. But here's the kicker. 5,600 manuscripts. Julius Caesar only had 10 manuscripts. Aristotle only had 49. And Plato only had 7. The New Testament has 5,600. And here's what started. You won't believe this, but you could get a Greek New Testament. And all of these manuscripts are available online for free. You could get a Greek, Greek New Testament, look up the manuscripts online, and compare them yourself. It is greater than 99.5% accurate. The differences within these manuscripts, which, by the way, do not affect doctrine whatsoever, are equivalent to a half a page in a 500 page novel. And it doesn't affect any teaching or doctrine. It's all stuff like misspellings, omitted words, and uh, repeated words, and uh, an occasional synonym. That's all it is. It's trustworthy, guys. So when we have this Bible, to sum it up, really, this Bible claims to be the Word of God, and it claims to be written by God that cannot lie, cannot change, cannot contradict himself. And when we put it up against scrutiny, careful scrutiny, and we test it by everything that can be tested, Jesus says in, in uh, John 3.12 that if you, if you could trust him on the earthly things that could be tested, that you could trust him on the spiritual it is so scary accurate without error. It's a trustworthy record. And that's why I believe it's the Word of God. It's historically reliable. It's, it's philosophically reliable. It's scientifically reliable. In every area that this book can be tested, it is found to be reliable. So the places that can't be tested, the spiritual areas that cannot be tested with our observation, we can trust it. That includes your salvation. That includes all the things that happened in the past. We can trust it. And I think that's why the Bible is the Word of God. And this is the authority that we fact check our watching and using by. This is an authority. It's an absolute truth, and we can stand on it. So whenever man's opinion that cannot be tested contradicts this, we can say, uh, you have no proof for what you believe. But I have a trustworthy source that tells me the truth. And I'm going to just stand on this one. I'm going to stand on it about my creation. I'm going to stand on it about the flood. I'm going to stand on it about all the messianic promises. I'm going to stand on it about the death, burial, and resurrection. I'm going to stand on it about the divinity of Christ. And I'm going to stand on it about his return, the tribulation, the kingdom, and eternity. I'm going to stand on about the existence of hell. I'm going to stand on it about the existence of heaven. I'm going to stand on it about everything because it is trustworthy. It is my authority. My, my reason is finite. It changes. It can't be trusted. But this word right here has been confirmed true and trustworthy for the past 2,000 years, and I have no reason to deny it. That's what the, word, that's what the Christian faith is built on. It is built on faith. 
Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith it's impossible to please them. You're going to place your faith in something. The question is, is what you're placing your faith in, is it trustworthy or is it shaky? I maintain that the Christian faith is very trustworthy and that we can hang our hat on. And that's why I'm a Christian. Period. So we have to really, really uh, get that name down. So how to handle a scoffer? As I said before, you, you just take them through. When, whenever they reject them, I would start off with that John 3.12 which says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You can just say, hey, you, you can take them through everything I've said, or take them through the presuppositions. Um, just pretty much the whole class here. This is how you handle the uh, handle a scoffer, but you start off with that idea of if this is a trustworthy eyewitness, we can hang our head on it. What trustworthy do? What what's trustworthy about your own logical reason? You see, so how to handle a scoffer would be just that. You have got to bring, somehow take them to this discussion and help them see that in reality they have two choices and only two choices. And this is how I usually uh, like to like to say I like sir. I like to approach them very kindly as like, sir, I, I totally disagree with your stance, but I have a differing opinion and a differing view on whatever it is we're discussing, but I don't want to argue with you. I'd love to debate with you. I don't want to argue with you. Would you be willing to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion? And if they agree to it, the first thing you should do, number one, is establish the existence of God by using the arguments that I said, and that's assuming they're an atheist. If they're not an atheist and they're a theist, then you can just skip that. Because again, don't don't defend what they don't reject. But number two, defend the Bible as an authority. Biblical authority. And this is where you go through the very steps that I went through right here. And you end with that idea of where Jesus says, if you can believe the earthly things written here, then you can believe the spiritual. And the, spirit, and, and the facts written in this book are a lot more solid than your logical reason. And that is why I implore you to read this take it to heart and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection for, for your salvation. Because if I'm right and you're wrong, then there's, uh, well, if you're right and I'm wrong, then there's no consequence when we die. But if I'm right and you're wrong, then there's a literal hell pain. So are you willing to take that gamble just off of your own finite reason? Or are you going to allow me to step through this and and show you how this is true. Don't gamble with your eternity just off of a hunch or off of your feelings. Make sure you have all the facts straight before you make a final decision. And that's how I usually try to take people through it whenever you're dealing with the skeptic and the scholar. So, other than that, I think that's pretty much it. That's a crash course that's quick, I know. Patrick, I'll give you these, uh, I'll, I'll give you this uh, curriculum so you can look through it as well. But, um, you know, and also just go to the answers in Genesis.org and that will really help you break down this stuff as well. And please, BibleFramework.com, Charles Clough. Take that, take that course if you really want to be able to uh, knock this stuff down too. But let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for our time together. Please keep us safe as we go back home and give us a good weekend. In Jesus' name.